Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 102 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Today, we travel west to Kentucky and to what early Americans called the Illinois country, a region located roughly between present-day Indiana and Missouri. And we're going west so we can explore the life and deeds of George Rogers Clark, who led a portion of the Virginia and Kentucky militias to capture and hold the Illinois country during the American War for Independence. William Nestor, a professor of government and politics and environmental studies at St. John's University and author of George Rogers Clark, I Glory in War, will serve as our guide. During our exploration, Bill reveals who George Rogers Clark was, the Illinois country, and why Clark felt the Patriots needed to capture and hold the territory during the War for Independence, and how George Rogers Clark almost came to lead an early version of the Corps of Discovery. But first, this is a special episode. And it's special because it's a listener request. Although most episodes that air now are listener requests, this was the very first listener request I ever received. As you may know, the first episodes of Ben Franklin's World posted on October 7, 2014. And the day the show launched, I was visiting with my grandmother. As I worked on my laptop to make sure that everything had launched smoothly, Grandma inquired what I was doing. Naturally, we had a conversation about what podcasts are, why I started one, and what a few of my future episodes would be. And then Grandma asked, could I do an episode on George Rogers Clark? I said, sure, Grandma, I can do that. Famous last words. It's taken almost two years to find someone who could speak about George Rogers Clark and that was willing to be interviewed for this show. And since Grandma's initial request... Others have written in and tweeted me about doing an episode on George Rogers Clark. So needless to say, I felt a lot of pressure to do this episode. And I think it was worth the wait. So here it is, Grandma, your much-awaited episode on George Rogers Clark. I really hope you enjoy it. And know that I offer it to you as your birthday present. Because you keep telling me that you don't need any more stuff for your house. So here's a gift for your brain. Happy birthday, Grandma. Are you ready to venture west into some of the frontier places of early America? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a professor of government and politics and environmental studies at St. John's University. He is the author of 35 books, each of which explores different facets of international relations, military history, and the nature of power. Today, he will discuss details from one of those books, George Rogers Clark, I Glory in War, which won the Army Historical Foundation Award for Best Biography in 2013. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, William Nestor. Well, thank you, Liz. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. In George Rogers Clark, Bill claims that George Rogers Clark was one of the greatest generals in the American War for Independence. Bill, would you briefly tell us who George Rogers Clark was and why you think he was one of the greatest generals in the War for Independence? So general perhaps isn't quite the right word. He was one of the greatest military leaders of the War for Independence. He became a general later in the war, but he was a brilliant warrior and leader of men. He was highly charismatic, and he literally could whip up his followers to, at one point, go through a week of wilderness trek and capture a British fort. So general perhaps isn't quite the right word. But as a military leader, he was at the top of the American level. Why do you think that Clark was able to whip up, as you put it, his followers so effectively? What made him a good leader of men? Well, his charisma, his endurance, his physical prowess, his mind. He was a great tactician and strategist. And again, he was able to motivate his men to extraordinary feats. Let's explore the life of George Rogers Clark in more detail so we can learn more about his accomplishments and see if we can discover how he became such a good leader. Bill, would you tell us about Clark's childhood and education? The family grew up in eastern Virginia. He was tutored as a boy. He learned surveying as a profession, but 
got away from that. He was highly intelligent, and he simply had an innate understanding of human nature and used that both in war and diplomacy. You mentioned that Clark grew up in Virginia. In your book, you note that Kentucky played a large role in Clark's life and wartime accomplishments. Would you tell us about Kentucky in the 1770s and what brought Clark to settle there? Kentucky was part of Virginia. It was an undeveloped part. The first Americans began to go there in the 1760s into the 1770s, the long hunters, people like Daniel Boone, who spent months, sometimes even more, in that land. Now, that land was the so-called dark and bloody ground. It was a neutral ground between the Indians north of the Ohio River and Indians below that, like the Cherokee and the Choctaw and the Chickasaw. So they would use that as a hunting ground. And then these Americans came along. And Clark first went there in 1772 as a surveyor. He went down the Ohio River and began to survey the lands there. And he was so enamored of what he saw that he staked claims there himself. He next went down in 1774, but that was amidst Lord Dunmore's War, which is a war between the colony of Virginia and the Indians of the upper Ohio Valley. So he participated in that war. In 1774 was when the first permanent settlement was founded in what is now Kentucky, uh, Harrodsburg or Harrodstown, and then Boonesboro, founded by Daniel Boone the following year. So slowly, 1774, it becomes ever more settled in what is now central Kentucky. And Clark was one of those early pioneers there. And then when the war with Britain broke out, 1775, he was a militia captain. And then he rose up the ranks from there. Yeah. Let's talk about the War for Independence in Kentucky. Would you tell us about the dangers Kentucky faced during the War for Independence? Because it really seems like Kentucky should have been far enough removed from the danger of the war, given its distance from the eastern seaboard. Well, the dangers were incessant, and they were from Indians supplied and sometimes led by British officers. And so there were continual Indian raids, mostly from north of the Ohio River, but occasionally from the Cherokee and even the Chickasaw from the south. And so Kentucky settlers were in a constant state of tension and often faced you know, Indian attacks throughout their time there. What role did George Rogers Clark play in preparing and defending Kentucky from war? Well, in 1776, he played a critical role in that the settlers, who now numbered oh, several hundred, were almost out of gunpowder. So he and another guy, a guy named John Jones, trekked eastward and went all the way to Williamsburg, then the capital of Virginia, and pleaded for gunpowder from then Governor Patrick Henry. And he supplied it. And they were able to take it back there. And that was Clark's first meeting with Governor Patrick Henry. And then the following year, he would go back to Kentucky and pitch his idea for the conquest of the Illinois country. He would carry the war north of the Ohio River against the British and Indians there. In your book, George Rogers Clark, you made it clear that Clark became convinced that if he was going to protect the West, to protect Kentucky, he had to secure the Illinois country. Would you tell us about the Illinois country? Where was it and who lived there? Well, the British government east of the Mississippi River, it's between the Mississippi and Wabash Rivers. Those are the present boundaries of the modern state of Illinois. But at that time, there were just a few settlements originally settled by the French. And then after the French and Indian War, the British and Americans conquered that. It became part of the British Empire. And so Clark's idea is to take the war to the enemy. And by capturing the settlements in what is now Illinois, he could plug that particular corridor through which the Indian tribes attacked settlers in Kentucky. So that's a good example of his strategic vision. He was thinking in large terms. It was not simply, how do we defend immediately our settlements here in Kentucky? What's the big picture? And Clark really excelled at that, which is what made him a first-rate American military leader and eventually general. It seems like there was a lot of interest in the Illinois country during the mid to late 18th century. You have French settlements, Spanish settlements, British settlements, and American settlements, plus all of the Native American groups that happened to live there. Why did everyone want to possess the Illinois country? What made it so special? Well, strategically, you have the confluence of two rivers, the Ohio with the Mississippi. So northeast of that is the Ohio country, mostly French settlers. So their loyalty to Britain was superficial at best. And so Clark's conception is that you can sway them to the American side and form this bulwark against the British further north. And Detroit is really the base of operations for the British in the Northwest. So taking Illinois is the first step, ideally, to eventually taking Detroit. Was Clark right 
Was the Illinois country really important for the Americans to capture and hold during the war for independence? Symbolically, yes, it certainly was. But the negotiations were in Paris. And both the British and the Americans, you might recall that Benjamin Franklin, eventually John Adams, were critical players in the negotiations for the end of the war. The American team and the British diplomatic teams really didn't know clearly what was going on in that part of the world. Their interests were elsewhere. That was the secondary theater to them. You know, reports would trickle back both from the British side and the American side that, yes, Clark had captured parts of this or that the British were trying to retake it. But it wasn't a primary concern. But it became critical because in the Treaty of Paris, which ends the American Revolution, whereby the British grant independence to the United States, the British recognize the United States all the way to the Mississippi River. And certainly Clark's conquest of what is lower Illinois was an important part of that. But he never went beyond that. Okay. But nonetheless, it was an important part of why we ended up not at the Appalachian Mountains, but at the Mississippi River at the end of the war. Now that we know what the Illinois country was and the importance it had for Kentucky and the United States, Would you tell us what actions Clark took to secure the region? In 1777, he went back from Kentucky to Williamsburg, and he talked Governor Patrick Henry into trying to capture that Illinois country. And so Patrick Henry was able to get the Virginia Assembly to allocate a certain amount of money and military supplies, giving a commission as a lieutenant colonel at that time to organize an expedition that would go down the Ohio River and eventually up to take that territory. So on July 4th, 1778, Clark had led his men overland from southern Illinois to Kaskakia. Kaskakia is roughly across the river from San Jean in Missouri today. And he captured Kaskakia essentially without any bloodshed. And then he sent a contingent up to take Cahokia. Cahokia is east of the Mississippi, just across from St. Louis. He sent another contingent by boat up the Wabash to take Vincennes. So he had secured that land in this coup pretty much bloodless and was able to rally the French and the local Indians behind that acquisition, that takeover. How many men did Clark have to accomplish his bloodless coup with? Because it sounds like his forces must have been very spread out across the Illinois country. Well, he's got roughly 175 men, most of which are in Kaskakia. I think he had a contingent of about 25, 30 that took over Vincennes. All these posts are lightly held. Okay, He caught the British completely by surprise. But Henry Hamilton, the governor and general of the Northwest Territory, headquartered in Detroit, is able to later that year retake Vincennes, okay? And Fort Sackville was the local fort there. And so that's when Clark really excelled and reached his peak as a military leader, because in January and February of 1778, he leads about 150 men from Kaskakia overland up under miles almost through the winter. And it was a rainy winter and the creeks swelled into small rivers, small rivers into rather large and formidable lakes. And it really was an extraordinary epic trip across there. Meanwhile, he sent another contingent, about 50 men by boat up the Ohio River and eventually the Wabash. And he and his men appeared before Fort Sackville, Hamilton's inside with about 50 or so British regulars. And he besieges the fort and through both rifle fire, but also psychology, he was able to force Hamilton to surrender. And the psychology was really fascinating and rather gruesome. A war party that Hamilton had sent against the Kentucky settlements happened to be returning when Clark and his men are besieging Fort Sackville. And that war party was not aware that this fort was under siege. There was a lull in the fighting when they appeared. Clark sends his contingent out there. They capture these men who are a few Britisher with them, but it's mostly Indians. And the Indians are carrying the scalps of Kentucky settlers. So Clark lines up these men, and it's not clear who exactly was the executor, but someone buried a tomahawk in the heads of several of these men in view of the fort with the obvious message, this will be your fate unless you don't surrender soon. And that's eventually what Hamilton did. Now, Hamilton is known by the Americans as the hair buyer because he would ransom both 
prisoners that were brought back, but also he would pay for scalps brought from the dead bodies of American settlers in Kentucky. He would supply the Indians with arms and ammunition and other things they needed to keep going back down south of the Ohio and pack the settlers there. So capturing Hamilton and recapturing Vincennes was enormously important below to the British west of the Appalachians in the Ohio Valley. Native Americans usually played a large role in American frontier warfare. What role did they play in this British and American fight for the Illinois country? Most of the tribes are fighting for the British, but when Clark initially went up to capture Kaskakia, he was able through diplomacy to get some of them, at least in that region, to bear allegiance to the United States. So the tribes are fighting for their own survival, and they're willing to ally at least temporarily with whichever side appeared to best serve their own interest. And that usually was the stronger side. And so when Clark appears with these tough frontiersmen and the British, you know, the British had a minimal presence there, that made sense for the Indians in that area to bear allegiance to the United States. But in what is now Ohio, those tribes, especially the Shawnee, but to a lesser extent, the Wyandots and some of the Delaware, they continued to fight and send raiding parties into central Kentucky. How and what did the colonial settlers in the region think about the fight for and around their homes? Well, they're fighting for their very survival, and the French settlers, as I mentioned earlier, bear no sentimental ties to Britain, so they were willing to side with the Americans just as the Indians were in that area, because it simply was in their interest to do so. But the trouble was that Clark and other frontier commanders had trouble getting supplies to them, so their allegiance, both the French settlers and the Indians, began to falter. And so it was a very tense situation throughout those years. So the Americans are occupying that land. Now think about the more recent wars in which the United States has occupied an alien population. Many of the same things were present at that time. People who don't want you there to begin with, but have to deal with the fact that you're the most powerful player now, but they're looking both to their immediate term, how do we prevent ourselves from being robbed or even killed by these invaders? And over the long term, how can we get rid of them? And if we can't get rid of them, how do we accommodate ourselves to them? So some things are just constants in history, and Clark played a major role in this whole occupation. This seems like a complicated occupation for Clark, because the British are in Detroit and Canada looking down upon him. He's trying to occupy a large territory with a total of 175 men. The local, mostly French settler population doesn't seem to be at all fond of him or the American cause. And there are a lot of different Native American groups with their own diplomatic and political agendas. Yeah, here again, Clark was a great military and diplomatic leader. He didn't speak any Indian languages. He had never lived with the Indians, but he knew intuitively and from simply interacting with them how to deal with them both through a show of strength and force, but also through generosity. Okay, and and sort of playing good cop, bad cop at the same time at the same conferences. So he's very effective at that. Now, again, we have to remember that even though it's a vast territory, it's sparsely populated and there are these small pockets of settlements. And they're so isolated that a handful of tough frontiersmen can hold it for a while. But as I mentioned earlier, the British were able to retake with overwhelming force Vincennes until Clark was able to retake Vincennes for the Americans. Would you give us an example of Clark using his brand of diplomacy at one of the Native American conferences he participated in? What did Clark intuitively do, given that he didn't speak any of their languages? Well, he's working with interpreters, and he was very eloquent in getting into the rhythms and the images of how Indians conducted diplomacy, very poetic in many ways. I'll give you an example from one of his councils, again, playing both tough guy and both a benefactor and a potential destroyer of them. At one point during a conference, he took some wampum and he ground it under his heel, okay, before the rather shocked participants, both Indian and American. But after that, he became more conciliatory, okay? So again, a lot of it was bluff because certainly in the Illinois country, the Americans were outnumbered by both the Indian and French. So you had to use a lot of sort of chutzpah or bluff in trying to keep them quelled. And so he was very effective at that. Did George Rogers Clark ever attempt to go after the British position in Detroit and remove them from the region completely? 
Detroit was his goal, his ultimate goal, because he were able to capture Detroit, the headquarters, the base of operations for the British west of the Appalachians. That would pretty much effectively end the fighting in that part of the continent. It would stop to a trickle, the Indian raids against the American settlements. But unfortunately, he was never able to get within a few hundred miles of Detroit. He launched a couple of expeditions into what is now southwestern Ohio. Most notably, he was able to capture and destroy the Shawnee village of Piqua, which is now roughly where Springfield, Ohio is today. But that was the closest he got to Detroit. It was just too far. He had too few supplies, too few men to make that march northward. After Charles Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, war between Native American, Loyalist, and Patriot fighters continued to rage. On March 2nd, 1782, a group of Pennsylvania militia slaughtered 90 Native American Moravians at Naddenhutton. Bill, Would you tell us about the ramifications of this massacre for George Rogers Clark and his fellow Kentuckians? The ramifications for Clark were not direct because at this point, he has made his own headquarters at Louisville, further down the Ohio Valley. But there were expeditions which were from Pittsburgh and from northern Kentucky, which tried to go up and attack the Indians in central and even northern Ohio. There's one expedition that got as far as Sandusky, but it was cut off and largely cut to pieces. And there was vengeance there for these Indians who were Moravian Indians. They were peaceful Indians. They were Christians, Moravian Christians who were slaughtered by these frontiersmen. And so those who were captured during the Sandusky campaign, the Americans who were captured, were tortured to death very gruesomely by the Indians there, which were a collection of tribes, Shawnee, Wyandotte, and Delaware. Part of the Delaware were those Moravian Indians who were slaughtered in Guana Newton. Scholars like to say that the American War for Independence was a civil war between Britons and British Americans, but it also seems like there was a civil war raging between settlers living in the frontiers and the Native Americans who lived around them, especially when we look at massacres like the one at Naddenhutton and retaliatory raids that came after. Bill, is it appropriate for us to view the War for Independence as a civil war in this settler versus Native American context? Certainly, it was a war within a war, a civil war within the larger international war. The international war was between the American people and the British people. The civil war was between the loyalists and the patriots who were Americans. And so some of the tribes were caught in between, including the small band of people, those Moravian Indians at Nanahutten, who happened to be on the war trail between the upper Ohio region and central Ohio and northern Ohio. And tragically, horrifically, one of the American expeditions simply slaughtered them because for various reasons, they didn't want to go further than that. Slaughtered these innocent people. And then it's just one of the great tragedies of that war in American history. I believe about 100 men, women, and children who were pacifists and Christians were killed during that terrible incident. By the time that Great Britain and the United States agreed to the terms of the Treaty of Paris 1783, the people in Kentucky and Illinois region had lived hard frontier lives and they had lived through a violent war. George Rogers Clark likewise lived through this harsh, violent period. He fought for the Illinois country with few men, few supplies, and often in inclement weather. So, Bill, what happened to Clark after his wartime experiences? Clark's career and life peaked in his 20s. That was during the American Revolution. And from there, for the next 40 years, it was a steady downhill decline with some real plummets along the way, most notably that terrible amputation following a stroke. And so he spent the last 40 years embittered and often would go off on these rants. It wasn't a happy life that Clark led. And because his family was so loving, they gave him the support he could. But it must have been difficult even for them to deal with him at times. You know, he had this incredible series of triumphs during the revolution and just a series of small and major tragedies thereafter. In George Rogers Clark, you mentioned that Clark had a lot of financial problems after the war because of his efforts to supply his troops during the war. Would you tell us about his financial problems? Both Virginia and the United States government were deadbeats, in a sense, not paying him back. Now, part of it was Clark's problem. He was not a bookkeeper. And so he would make these requisitions, but he didn't have the documentary proof of them. He just had claims after the war. And of course, any bureaucracy has to deal with real documents. They can't simply take people's word for what they claim to have spent. 
Ironically, after Clark died, the Virginia government paid, I think, $30,000, which is an enormous sum at the time, to the Clark family. And if they had done so in the 1780s rather than long after his passage, he died in 1818, that might have been enough to change his life in many positive ways, but that simply didn't happen. Between the mid-1780s and late 1790s, Clark became involved in conspiracies with France and Spain. Bill, would you tell us about these conspiracies and what drove Clark, a famed and respected general, to turn his back on the United States? Was it his financial problems? Every phase of Clark's life is fascinating in its own way. He was very embittered after the war because he felt that both the Virginia government and the American government had let him down. He had all these debts that he had incurred in trying to supply his men, signing these vouchers for ammunitions, for food, for uniforms, and so forth. And neither Virginia nor the American government would compensate him. So he was very embittered at that. And there was all this land for possibly for the taking west of the Mississippi, happened to be part of the Spanish Empire. He became one of the first so-called filibusters, groups of Americans who tried to take over foreign lands. First, he wanted to grab parts of the Spanish Empire, actually conquer it. But then this character, one of the more nefarious characters in American history, a guy named James Wilkinson, who was in the American Revolution, he was no hero. He was no military leader in a combat role. He was a politician within the army who, through his own charisma, rose to become a general. But in the mid-1780s, Wilkinson becomes an agent, a secret agent, for the Spanish Empire. And Wilkinson goes to the Ohio Valley, to Kentucky, and to other settlements in that region, and tries to talk influential leaders like Clark, influential men, into somehow he plays on their feeling of alienation from the country east of the Appalachians. They feel cut off. They feel neglected. But why not make our own country out here? And we can be the founding fathers of that country. Of course, he's on the Spanish payroll. And from the Spanish point of view, this is ideal, right? You don't want this large, growing, dynamic, enterprising United States, your neighbor. It would be great to have the western portion, west of the Appalachians, split off, become this weak country dependent on Spain because the produce, the production of the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee, and Cumberland Valleys runs down the Mississippi River and out through New Orleans, which is controlled by the Spanish. And the Spanish cut off that trade route, trying to provoke those Americans to either give in to the Spanish and revolt against the American government or at least contain them there. Okay, So Wilkinson is trying to play on that resentment and Clark, sort of unwittingly at this point, becomes part of that general attitude. Now, for a, a while, Clark actually petitioned the Spanish government to found a colony within the Spanish Empire in the Mississippi Valley. What that would have entailed would Clark would have organized a group of settlers who would go and settle there, in return for which they would claim allegiance to Spain and convert from Protestantism to Catholicism. So essentially, they would turn their backs in their own country, immigrate, and become members of another. And then <laughs> he flips from that during the French Revolution. The French Revolution starts 1789, becomes increasingly radicalized. Eventually, these revolutionaries depose their own monarchy. They execute their king, capitate their king, and then their queen, and end up going to war against pretty much the rest of Europe, including Spain. So the revolutionary government sends over to the United States this ambassador, or minister as it was called at the time, a guy named Edmond Genet, who is trying to get the Americans to ally with France against Spain and Britain. And Genet sends out another guy, a naturalist named André Michaud, to the Ohio Valley and to contact prominent Americans like Clark and try to get them to fight for France against Spain. Okay. And so Michaud actually gives Clark a major general's commission. Now, think about that. <laughs> Clark actually had a higher rank in the French army than he had in the American army, where he was just a brigadier general. Clark's job was to organize an expedition that would descend the Ohio Valley, attack first New Madrid, which is in Missouri, capture that strategic point, then work northward up the west bank of the Mississippi River till he captures St. Louis. Having secured upper Louisiana, Clark would then descend the Mississippi River and capture lower Louisiana, pretty much from not just Mississippi today, all the way down to New Orleans. That was the plan. But he was thwarted in that. First of all, President Washington issues 
a proclamation of neutrality. The United States would remain on the sidelines from the wars raging across Europe between revolutionary France and all these countries, these monarchies that are determined to destroy that republic. And as a consequence, any Americans who aided either side would be considered in violation of American law. So this scheme of Clark was rendered illegal. And there were other things that happened as well. So none of his schemes during the late 1780s into the 1790s involving somehow taking over parts of Spanish Louisiana came to fruition. But it occupied a lot of his time. And even worse, he ended up losing ever more money going deeper into debt to creditors as he tried to organize these schemes, which none of them paid back a penny. We've discussed that Clark had a lot of debt at the end of the war and that his debts made him embittered towards life in the United States. But what did Clark do that caused President John Adams to want to arrest him under the Sedition Act of 1798? Yeah, the the Sedition Act, it's one of the more gross violations of the Constitution. Essentially, this law outlawed the First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and freedom of the press, and that anybody who said or published anything critical of the government was liable to arrest. Well, here's Clark speaking out strongly against the American government and associated with all these schemes, these filibustering schemes in the Mississippi Valley. So for a year, Clark had to go into hiding in St. Louis. He actually lived in St. Louis in Spanish territory during that time. Very little is known about just what he did. There's almost no documented evidence at that time. But eventually, after the law sort of went into abeyance, Clark came back to Louisville, Kentucky with his family. What was Clark's life like after his exile? How did his friends, family, and neighbors in Kentucky treat him? Well, fortunately, he has a very supportive and extensive family, the Clark clan in a sense, and they've got homes in the Louisville area. Clark himself has started his own settlement just across the Ohio River from Louisville in what becomes known as Clarksville. He's got his own home there, but he's frequently back staying with his relatives there. And so this is a long period of decline for Clark and a very sad and frankly a pathetic time. His alcoholism worsens at one point. He suffers a stroke in 1809. This is at his home in Clarksville. I think he's got a slave that takes care of him up there. He's pretty much living by himself. He suffers a stroke and his leg is badly burned in the fireplace and has to be amputated. And from then on, basically, he lives with his relatives, first with his uh, sister Fanny and, and their family in Louisville. And then later, he spends his last years out at Locust Grove, this beautiful plantation, which is still there. It's a state park in Kentucky. And that's where he spends his final nine years. Leg amputated, deeper alcoholism, dependent on his family for his care. Before we move into the time warp, there's one more aspect of Clark's life we should really explore. After the War for Independence, Virginia released Clark from his command and he retired to Kentucky. During his retirement, Clark corresponded with Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson invited him to lead an exploration of the West. Bill, would you tell us how George Rogers Clark almost came to lead the Corps of Discovery? Years before Meriwether Lewis and Clark's younger brother, William, set out for the Pacific? It's a fascinating story. George Rogers Clark and Thomas Jefferson had this long distant and times more close relationship when times when Clark went to Virginia and was able to meet with Jefferson. Each admired something in the other that he he was lacking in itself. Clark really looked up to Jefferson's erudition and learning and sophistication. And Jefferson looked at Clark as this quintessential frontiersman, explorer, and fighter. And Jefferson, you know, he grew up in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains. He was fascinated with the natural world. He was fascinated with geography. From an early age, Jefferson was thinking, what lays beyond the Appalachian? What lays beyond the Mississippi? He was looking at the crude maps of that time, dreaming of somehow getting across the country. And Clark was the man to do it, possibly. And so after the war, Jefferson wrote a letter to Clark saying, well, I'm thinking of this expedition to go to the Pacific. Would you be interested? And Clark said no. Okay. He was then involved in all sorts of business schemes in Kentucky. He was petitioning the American government for compensation. He had written all these bad checks, frankly, during the war to supply his men. He wanted compensation for that. From a practical point of view, an expedition across the country simply was not possible at that time. This was one of Jefferson's great visions that eventually a generation he would be able to launch and fulfill through Clark's younger brother, William. But at the time, none of this was a possibility. 
possibility. By the time, you know, a generation later that it was a possibility, George Rogers Clark was in his 50s and in declining health. He was addicted to alcohol at that time. He was in no condition to lead any expedition, but his younger brother, William, was. William, of course, teaming up with Meriwether Lewis to lead that epic journey two and a half years across the continent and back. But the original idea was planted by Jefferson with George Rogers Clark. Ed would like to know what influence George Rogers Clark had on his brother William. Just give you a little background. It was a prolific family of the Clarks. There were six boys and four girls who lived to adulthood. Okay, it was a very close, very loving family. During the American Revolution, five of the six brothers, and George Rogers was the second oldest boy, five of the six fought in the American Revolution. William was too young. He was just a young teenager at the time. So rare times when the brothers got together, William would just sit in fascination, listen to his older brothers trade war tales and the camaraderie amongst soldiers. He just was so impressive to him. Now, William Clark eventually does join the army. He gets involved in the campaigns against the uh, Northwest Indians. He was at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in the mid-1790s. And eventually, at that time, he meets Meriwether Lewis. They become friends. And when Jefferson asked Lewis to lead that expedition, Lewis thinks of his old army buddy, William Clark, as the perfect partner to pull off this incredible expedition. It's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if British Major Henry Hamilton had known that Clark and his men were planning to attack Fort Sackville and retake Vincennes in February 1779. Would Hamilton and his men have repelled Clark's attack? If so, how would British possession of Vincennes and presence in the Illinois country have affected the American War for Independence? That's a fascinating question, Liz. And Clark and his men, after this week trek through the wilderness, this rain-sodden wilderness from Kaskakia to Vincennes. The last part was the toughest. They had to get over the rain-swollen Wabash River, and they were able to do so. We don't have time, unfortunately, on the fascinating details, but eventually able to get some boats and get across the river. But once they got on the east side of the river where Vincennes was, they were vulnerable. They were exhausted. Probably most of their gunpowder was soaked. Their guns were all rusty. Had Hamilton somehow become aware of their presence at that time and been bold enough to set forth, so there was a core of British regulars, he would have had to rouse the local French militia. Had they gone, they might well have captured Clark and his men when they were most vulnerable. And had they done that, well, the British would have secured that segment rather than lost it. And that would have been known in Paris during the negotiations of the end of the war. And it might well have meant the British kept the Northwest rather than ceded it to the United States. And that would have had an enormous effect on American development. Now, eventually, the Americans might well have retaken that or taken that in the subsequent 1812 war, okay, because the causes of the 1812 war would have been the same if the British had the Northwest, but we'll just never know. But that certainly would have shifted the balance of power in the Ohio Valley and thus shifted the consciousness and importance of that Northwest Territory for the British and American diplomats in Paris. A really interesting question, Liz. Each of your 35 books explores some aspect of international relations, military history, and the nature of power. What will book 36 explore? Well, (laughs) I just finished a book called Winston Churchill and the Art of Power. And so I'm trying to find an agent who uh, hopefully can uh, get that published. So if we have any agents in the audience, give me a call, please. (laughs) Where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about George Rogers Clark or if we think we want to be your next agent. I teach at St. John's University, and uh, you're welcome to email me, mrw at stjohns.edu, or you can enroll at St. John's and take some of my classes. We can always use some new good students. William Nestor, thank you for taking us through the life of George Rogers Clark and some of his accomplishments. Liz, thank you. It was a pleasure, and once again, I can't give you enough compliments for your wonderful Ben Franklin's world. Keep up the great work. George Rogers Clark lived an interesting and hard life. Born in Virginia, he set out for Kentucky in his late teens to practice the trade of surveying. And while surveying Kentucky lands, Clark fell in love. 
so he made a claim and he settled on some Kentucky lands. Like many settlers, Clark found life in Kentucky hard. He had to clear land, build a house, and establish a farm. Plus, he also had to protect himself. The region proved to be a dangerous place, as tensions between Anglo-American settlers and Native American peoples often gave rise to armed conflict. And at times, imperial politics exacerbated this violence. This certainly proved to be the case during the American War for Independence. Now, rather than merely defend his home and neighbors in Kentucky, Clark went on the offensive during the War for Independence. He took the initiative to pitch Virginia Governor Patrick Henry for troops and supplies to capture and hold the Illinois country, a country important for both the British and Native Americans. Then, with about 175 men, Clark improbably accomplished his goal. He secured the region and worked to hold it until peace with Great Britain came. It's in part because of George Rogers Clark's actions that the United States secured Western lands from Great Britain in the Treaty of Paris 1783. Of course, as Bill noted, it would take a second war with Great Britain, the War of 1812, before the United States could firmly hold and govern those lands. You can find more information about Bill, his book George Rogers Clark, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 102. Although I prefer to listen to podcasts on my smartphone, Grandma likes to listen to episodes of Ben Franklin's World on her iPad. Either way, the Ben Franklin's World iOS and Android apps have us covered because both of us can listen to episodes of Ben Franklin's World on our preferred devices and know that we won't miss an episode. The apps are free and you can find them at your favorite app store. Finally, do you have a show topic request for Ben Franklin's World? Why not tell me about it? Send your requests to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.